away from the launch of this program. We've sort of been leading up to this with our 4th of July event and then Vacation Bible School and now uh, hoping to have this Truth Trackers become a, a part of our church ministries here uh, starting in just a few weeks. We want to help kids learn habits of devotion. We want to help them learn habits of Christian living. We want them to follow Jesus here at church and at home. We want to train up children in the way they should go. So when they're old, they won't walk away from Jesus. That's been the sort of the pattern of the young, younger generation over the course of the last um, couple of decades is that they go to church and they stay in church while they're still in school and then they get out of high school and they don't want to be in church anymore. They've, once they've got the opportunity to flee that, they run away. And we need to instill habits of godliness in young people so that won't be the case. So help us as a church and as parents to do everything we can to stem that tide, especially in the children that you have given to us. We pray, Father, for our teammates. We think of Ted and Becky Fletchell as they wrap things up and prepare to finalize their retirement this fall. I pray that you'll minister to them and through them as they have uh, moved back here to the States. They aren't intending to stop serving the Lord. They're just back here in the States and wanting to serve the Lord effectively here. So I pray for them. I also pray for our brothers and sisters across town at High Country Baptist Church. Pastor Parker and his wife Monica, and would ask that you would bless their service as they're meeting uh, right now, same time we are. Pray for our son, Chris, and for his work with National Christ Christian Foundation. would ask that you would continue to minister to him. He has a real burden for this and a passion to help uh, Christian ministries find the resources that they need in order to have an impact for Christ. And I pray that you'll minister through him in that regard. We also pray, Father, for those who are in positions of civic responsibility, for our president and vice president, for our governor, for our mayor, and for those who sit on city council and on the county commission. And in those cases, we think particularly this morning of Stephanie Fortune and Wayne Williams. We also would pray for Longinos Gonzalez as he serves on the county commission. And of course, Father, we think of our first responders and the work that they do, uh, protecting us, um, enforcing the laws uh, we appreciate them we also appreciate those that protect our homes from fire and uh, the work that they do sometimes is just beyond what we can imagine and we pray that you will minister to them as well and now father help us to see what devotion and sacrifice and adoration looks like in the life of Mary and then help us to apply that to our own lives we pray in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 12, if you want to open your Bibles. We have been in John 11 for the last number of Sundays that we've been in the John series and talking about the, the resurrection of Lazarus. And we're turning the page, in my Bible it's literally a turned page. John 12 starts at the top of the next page. Um, and some things are moving toward the week that Jesus is um, headed toward Calvary. But you're still going to see some things about the resurrection of Lazarus. You'll see it in this passage. Next week you'll see it in the passage that we're dealing with down starting with verse 9. So we haven't moved on from Lazarus entirely, but we've moved on from the story. The thought that I want you to take away this, with you this morning is that devotion resulted in sacrifice. And devotion always results in sacrifice. This week I, I got an email that was, it's called In the Nick of Time, and it's something that, that uh, the folks at Central Seminary send out. Uh, it's a blog that they put out every week on Friday. And I was working on Sunday's message. In fact, I'd already completed it. And um, Dr. Bowder wrote some things about adoration. 
and I thought I gotta add that in, and not just his words, but I've gotta add that thought about adoration in because what was going on in this chapter, in the first eight verses of this chapter, is adoration. Mary adored Jesus. Now we use the word adored in a number of different ways. Um, but when I say that Mary adored Jesus, that's not a statement of gratitude. It's not that Mary adored Jesus because Jesus raised her brother from the dead. Gratitude is thanksgiving for benefits. That's different. Thanksgiving is different than adoration. Adoration has to do with character. In other words, you adore on the basis of who someone is, not what they did for you. This is also not a romantic statement. Unfortunately, a lot of people in, down through the years, and particularly in, in our sensual age, want to take any female that they find in Scripture who, who says something nice about Jesus and make it sexual. It's just not the case. Mary adored Jesus, but it wasn't romantic. And it's not simple admiration. You know, you can admire someone impersonally. Those of you who are sports fans, you can, you can sit in the stands and watch a player from the other team literally dismantle your team and you can admire his talent while you not, you're not really thrilled with the outcome. Adoration is how you feel towards someone who has certain characteristics that you admire and you respond positively, personally, to what you know to be true. Mary admired Jesus, but she more than admired Jesus. She adored Jesus because of who he is. I just want you to keep that thought in mind as we move through this. Because we should be adoring Jesus as well. For those of you who don't come on Wednesday night, what we've been doing on Wednesday nights is we've been starting by asking the question, what is it this week that has caused you to adore Jesus? Now you can bring up something that you're thankful for as well, but what is it that's caused you to adore Jesus? What is it that caused you to adore your father? What is it that, 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 that leads you to that point? And that should be something that should be in our minds, and I hope that it's in your minds throughout the course of this passage. Now, if you've ever read through the Gospels, you probably have this vague recollection of the various writers all recording an anointing of Jesus. In fact, all four Gospels record an anointing, which has given rise to the question, is there more than one? Are all of these the same event? Matthew records his account in Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13. Mark shares his account in chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. Luke speaks of an anointing in Luke 7, verses 36 to 38. And of course, our text here this morning in John chapter 12. So does John's account mirror any of the others? Or are all of these accounts pointing to the same event? Or is there some difference? Are there different events that occurred? Without going into a lot of detail... We don't want to just sit here and do a seminary class on this, this question, but Matthew, Mark, and John are all writing about the same event. Luke is talking about a different event at a different time involving different people. So there is an anointing that Luke talks about. It's not the same event. Now, you can, you can go online right now. No, don't do it right now. After the service, and you can find people who will say the Luke account is the same as the John account. That's not accurate. Sometimes I'll say, I'm not sure that I would agree. I'll say it right. That's not accurate. Because it's different people involved. It's at a different time of Jesus' ministry and uh, at a, in a different place. So um, Matthew, Mark, and John are all talking about the same event, but not Luke. So we're, we won't talk about Luke's event today, but we are going to reference Matthew and Mark during the course of this morning's message. This text is a look back and a look ahead. We'll get into some more detail as the message moves along, but the passage looks back at the resurrection of Lazarus, which probably occurred not more than a few weeks earlier. Could have been as little as a week or two earlier. 
but it also looks ahead to the death and resurrection of Jesus, which was about a week away. So if you haven't already opened your Bibles, come with me to John 12, and let's look at this important event. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then we will um, get into the passage. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and, and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So let's look at the first couple verses and note Jesus' return to Bethany. The end of chapter 11, Jesus had retired from Bethany, left after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, to the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, chapter 11, verse 54. Ephraim was about 12 miles north of Jerusalem, Bethany area. Far enough away to relieve the pressure from the Sanhedrin, but close enough to get back into the thick of things on short notice. We, again, we don't know exactly how long Jesus and his disciples were in Ephraim, but it wasn't long, at the most a few weeks. The beginning of chapter 12 puts the account right back in Bethany. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Now that, that first phrase, six days before Passover, tells us the timing of his return. It also tells us in verse 2 that it coincided with a supper, and we'll talk about that supper in just a minute. He probably arrived in Bethany in time for the Sabbath, before sundown, Friday evening. Now that, that would be, you wouldn't think that it would be coming on the Sabbath for a couple of reasons. Sabbath travel restrictions, as well as the aforementioned supper, indicate that he arrived prior to the beginning of the Sabbath. Now that presents a, a bit of a problem because six days before the Passover, if you count it from Friday evening, takes you to Thursday evening the next week. And by a lot of people's reckonings, Passover didn't start on Thursday, it started on Friday. And yet the other synoptic, the other gospel writers, the synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, reckon Passover as beginning on Thursday evening if you see the Last Supper as occurring on Thursday evening. So that six days thing fits if you think of it from that perspective. So we're going to assume that Jesus arrived on Friday before sundown. Now John ties his return to the resurrection of Lazarus. It's back in the same town, Bethany, chapter or verse 1. The same family is involved in the supper. Martha's serving, Mary does this thing with the, the ointment, and Lazarus, it says, is at the supper reclining with the, the rest of the guests. And it would have been, that, that is, the event of raising Lazarus from the dead would have been fresh on everybody's mind. The apostle apparently wanted to be sure to connect those dots. Here is Jesus coming back into Bethany, connected to a previous miracle that occurred, and setting things up for another miracle that is about to occur. The previous miracle being the resurrection of Lazarus, the, the miracle that's about to, to occur, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I mentioned the supper. Verse 2 tells us about that supper. They made him, it says they made him a supper. But John doesn't specify who the they is. He does tell us Martha served. But he doesn't say who they were that made the supper. He doesn't even specify where the supper occurred. So Matthew and Mark fill that in for us. You don't have to go back and forth if you don't want to. It's Matthew 26. 
and Mark 14, if you want to put a finger there. But in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, what we find out is it was at the house of Simon the leper. Would you want to go to a supper at a leper's house? <laughs> no. No, I probably wouldn't want to do that either. Um, some have surmised that Simon was related to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, possibly even their father. That's a very intriguing thought. The problem is there's no supporting evidence for it. It's just a speculation. It's also possible that Simon, by the way, who was likely healed of his leprosy, or he wouldn't have been able to host a dinner like this, that Simon had invited people from the community, including Lazarus and his sisters. And then when he found out Jesus was coming, he invited him as well as an honored guest. Now, to be fair, that's also speculation. We don't know all of the details here. What we do know is there was a they who invited Jesus to be a part of this supper, and it was in the house of Simon the leper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was an invited guest, and Mary was there as well. We know all of that is true from the passage. So that's the setting. And it's occurring on the last Sabbath before the cross. Now what happened next is the reason these events are recorded for us. Verse 3 brings Mary into the story. John is the only one of the three gospel writers that address this event who identifies her by name. Matthew and Mark describe her simply as a woman. They don't give any name. They just say a woman did this. Now, once again, in verse 3, I'm sorry, in verse 2, you see Martha serving. And again, I, I don't want to discount Martha. Some of you here are Marthas. You love to serve. She displayed her devotion by giving herself in service to her Lord and others. That's not bad. But I also want you to know that Jesus honored Mary for her worship above honoring Martha for her service. There was something about Mary's worship that was more important to the Lord Jesus than Martha's service. Not that Martha's service was wrong. If Martha doesn't serve, and whoever served along with her, there is no supper. Right? So the service isn't wrong, but the worship is more highly valued. So keep that thought in mind as we move through here. Now, the one other thing I want to mention here about verse 3, and that is that Mary does all these things, and you're going to see in verse 4 and following that there is some objection to what Mary does. But I don't see any objection from either Martha or Lazarus when Mary offers her costly act of devotion. Now, I, I recognize it's an argument from silence. It doesn't say one way or the other, but there is no objection. Here in John, it, it, notes, it notes that, John, uh, that Judas objected. In Matthew and Mark, it says plural. Others objected as well, but it never point. It's the disciples. It's never pointing toward Martha and Lazarus. And I would think if Martha and Lazarus had objected to this, John might have noted that. So I'm going to assume, I know it's an argument from silence, you can pick it apart if you want, but I'm going to assume that Martha and, and Lazarus were on board with what Mary did. John tells us that Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. So the value of her devotion shows up in verse 3. The word translated pound is litra, which is about 11 ounces in modern measurements. So not a full pound. We would say 16 ounces is a pound. Um, so it's not a full pound that she had, but it would be their measurement. Spikenard, or nard, was a fragrant oil extracted from the root and what they called the spike, hence the word spikenard, of the nard plant, which was grown in India. So it wasn't grown around the corner in Judea or up the road in Samaria. It was, it was imported from India. The ointment was very costly. 
because it was a genuine article from a distant country. Pure nard. Now I'm about to reveal to you that I don't buy my wife perfume very often because I don't even know what the cost of this stuff is. I know it, it can, expensive perfume can, can be, you know, you can, here, here's a bottle, it's got an eighth of an ounce in it or something silly like that. And you touch a little bit and you touch here and it's supposed to last, you know, six weeks. <laughs> but what would you pay for expensive perfume? 100 bucks for 11 ounces? Maybe 500 if it was pretty expensive, a rare and highly prized fragrance, 500 for 11 ounces? That would be about 50 or $45 an ounce. That's probably closer. Well, Judas indicates that its value in verse, he says this in verse 5, was 300 denarii. That's a year's wage for a working man. So I did a little checking on what a year's wage for a working man is. ZipRecruiter says the average blue-collar salary in America today is over $52,000. So this is 11 ounces of nard that would be valued in today's money at $52,000. I've never bought Jan perfume for that much. I'm, I'm, I think you could take the thousand off, and I've never spent that much. I've never spent fifty-two dollars on perfume. If I did, I would probably be banished to the couch. So that's a pretty pricey perfume. The price of this offering indicates that Martha, Mary, and Lazarus were wealthy people. The average person couldn't touch this stuff, much less offer it as an act of worship. I also want you to see the humility in her devotion. The verse goes on to note that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Matthew and Mark tell us that Mary poured it on his head. And because that's the case, some people have said it must not be the same thing. Well, the fact that the one indicates that it was poured on his head and another that it was poured on his feet doesn't mean that both weren't done. And with 11 ounces of perfume, which is a lot of perfume, um, that she could easily have done some of the head and some of the feet and maybe a, a few drops on the shoulders and elbows and knees along with it. Who knows? The act of anointing his head is customary. You can go through Scripture, all through Scripture, and you can see a lot of anointings that involve the head. Uh, kings were anointed when they were when oil was poured on their head. Prophets were anointed. Um, uh, Aaron was anointed that way. Talks about it running down his beard and so forth. And so the the act of anointing almost always included the head, but the act of anointing his feet catches our attention. Jesus' feet would have been pointing away from the table as he reclined for the meal, so they were easily accessible. When they reclined for a meal, the table would be in the middle and you would lean into the table and your feet would be pointing out away from the table and that's how they would be all the way around the table. So it would have been accessible to get to his feet pretty easily. But to anoint the feet was, the feet are less respectable than the head. People walked around barefoot or in sandals that were open air. Their feet got dirty. Their feet picked, all, picked up all kinds of debris and filth. That's why homeowners had a slave come around and wash the feet of the guests that came into their home. And it wasn't just for the benefit of the guest. It was the, for the benefit of the homeowner. A lot of you when, you, when you have someone into your home, you'll say, would you please take off your shoes? Well, why? Well, because we, when we walk around, and our streets are a lot more sanitary than what they walked around in. You pick up things on your shoes, take them off, and then you don't track it all over the carpet. For Mary to anoint his feet and then to dab up the excess with her hair. It's an amazing act of humility, especially for a wealthy woman. When we were younger, um, Jan and I attended a service at 
what was then called Oak Grove Baptist Church, not called that anymore, but um, was then called Oak Grove Baptist Church. And there was a, a, one of the men in the church was a, very wealthy. He had become wealthy as a result of his work in construction. He was a deacon at the church. He essentially kept that church afloat for decades. And in many respects, kept Faith Baptist Bible College afloat. Um, he gave generously to both of those institutions. His name was Parmerly. I forget his first name. Mr. Parmerly is all I knew him as. Wealthy man. And we were at the church, and there was a problem in the, in the men's restroom. And the person that came with the bucket and the mop was Mr. Parmerly. Without question, the wealthiest man in the church but also a man with a servant's heart. And that's what you see in Mary here. Now, it also meant that she had to let her hair down in order to wipe Jesus' feet. That was not something that was typically done by women in mixed company and would have been a very embarrassing thing to do under normal circumstances. But Mary was not afraid to be embarrassed in her devotion to the Lord Jesus. Her devotion led naturally naturally to sacrifice. And then I've, I've noted here the impact of her devotion. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but, but no one in the room missed what she did. Even though it would have been visual to some in the room, it would have been less easy for others to see because of the nature of the table and where Jesus was and so forth. But it says also that the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Nobody missed it. For the rest of the meal, Jesus gave off the fragrance of her devotion. Everyone present knew how much Mary adored Jesus. That brings us to verse 4 and an old saying. Some of you have used it, usually with a bit of a wry smile on your lips. No good deed goes unpunished. Judas stepped in immediately to object to what Mary did. In verse 4, John doesn't mince any words. He wanted to be sure that we understood, as the readers, we understood exactly who it was who objected. It was Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. You know Simon's son? The one who betrayed Jesus. So he makes sure we understand this was Jesus' betrayer who spoke up. And he's going to say some other kind things about Judas here in just a moment. He wanted us to put this in the proper perspective, not only the objector, but the objection. Now, before you get too hard on Judas, Matthew says this, I'll just read it for you, but when his disciples, plural, saw it, they, plural, were indignant, saying, why this waste? So there was more than one that objected. I think Judas was the ringleader. That's why John points him out. But there was more than one who was thinking the same thing and maybe even saying it aloud. Mark says the same kind of thing. But there were some, plural, who were indignant among themselves, plural, and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? And then it goes on a little bit later and says, and they, plural, criticized her sharply. John singles Judas out with good reason. No doubt he was the ringleader in this. But he was certainly not alone. Several of the other disciples, maybe most of them, were thinking the same thing. Let me say something about what Mary was doing. This is worship. What Mary is offering is worship. Her adoration is worship because her adoration is directed toward the living God. Worship is an act of sacrifice. We sing a song sometimes to open our services. We bring the sacrifice of praise. Worship is an, is a, is a, is an act of sacrifice. And because it is sacrificial, some people see it as a, a waste of time and energy. Maybe even a waste of resources. Why would you do that? Why would you... Waste your time doing this. 
when I was working on my D-min, I was at lunch with some of the guys that I played hockey with, and one of them asked me why I didn't get a degree in something that was useful. A little bit of a grin on his face, but um, he was serious. I mean, he is, he's a construction guy. He doesn't know the Lord, doesn't want to know the Lord. Um, why aren't you doing, getting a degree in something that's useful? What a waste. But honest worship directed to our awesome God is never a waste. I'll say that again. Honest worship directed to our God is never a waste. It is what we are called to do. Now, the objection centered around how that costly fragrance could have been used. All three of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, record the nature of the objection. She should have sold that ointment or have given it to us to sell. And we could have given the proceeds to the poor. We ought to do something with this money for people who have a need. Now, as we're going to see from how Jesus responded, there's nothing wrong with ministering to the poor. If God has blessed you, sharing that blessing with others who have less is a recurring theme in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. So please don't think that Jesus or John or somehow Mary were taking a shot at the poor, that Mary didn't care about the poor. None of that could be further from the truth. But it is easy to criticize someone else for how they choose to show their devotion to God. You pour that money into honoring God. You could be, you could, you could be feeding people who need help. It's easy to trumpet, give to, give to the poor. It's even easy to meet a material need when the spiritual need is more important. What occurred here last Sunday is something that occurs here periodically at the church. People come and knock on the door, and they'll say, you know, I, I just got here from wherever, and I need help because I'm going to wherever, and I need gas or I need food or I need, you know, I, I, if you've got work around here to do, I'll do the work, and you can pay me. And so There's a lot of people coming in here and asking for help. That stuff happens all the time. And let me say, from my perspective, it's easier to give them something materially and send them on their way than it is to actually meet with them and talk with them about their needs. Most of the time, maybe not all, but most of the time, these are people who don't know the Lord. Their primary need is not gas. Their primary need is the gospel. It's easy to give them, take them down, put $10 of gas in your tank and say, see ya. It's harder to say, can we talk about this for a minute? Can we have a conversation about what your real needs are? Yeah, I'll help you with some gas, but let's talk about the Lord. Judas and whoever else joined in with him used what we today call virtue signaling. Are you familiar with that term? Maybe you've heard it in the political arena, but it's virtue signaling. And that is criticizing someone else for not doing what you think would be better. So I think, and I'm standing on, town of, on top of Mount Olympus here, I think you should have done X, and you didn't do it. So I'm more virtuous than you are. And that especially happens in the realm of social justice. But this criticism negated an act of worship. Judas said, you should not have worshipped Jesus. You should not have expressed your devotion to Jesus. And he did so supposing that an act of charity would have been more virtuous. So let's just put this into context here. Judas is saying it would have been better for you to sell this and give to the poor than for you to worship Almighty God right here in this room. Would have been better for you to do the other. And I can tell you right now, if there was a lot, if, if we got a cross-section of Colorado Springs sitting here in the room, they would have said, 
Yeah, I agree. Maybe some of you are sitting here thinking the same thing. That is not how Jesus thought. It is not how God thinks. Mary chose to honor God. Supposedly, Judas wanted to honor people instead of God. However, there was a reason for Judas' objection. John revealed something in verse 6 that Judas would never have admitted openly. He was a thief. Have you ever seen the bumper sticker that uh, says something on, on the order of, please don't steal, Congress hates competition? People in positions of power, pe people with, with their hand on the purse, often are thieves. Not always. Please don't misunderstand me. We have a treasure in our church. So far as I know, he's not one. He can slap me later for that. But people in positions where they can get their hands on the dough often get their hands on the dough. And Judas was one of those. John's the only scripture writer to reveal that about Judas, but it's entirely believable. I mean, think about it. He wanted control of that ointment so he could sell it and pilfer from the prophets. John said, this he said, he writes this, not because he cared for the poor. Oh. So Judas is deflecting away from what he really wanted to do by pretending that he cares about the poor. He pretends that the poor are important to him. Among the people sitting in the room that day, Judas might have been the one who cared the least for the poor. But he projected this idea that other people didn't care about the poor or they would have sold this money and given it to the poor. So John reveals that he had the money box, so he was the treasurer of the group, and he, had the, he was in the habit of helping himself. For what did Judas betray Jesus? 30 pieces of silver, money. Follow the money. Once he decided he didn't want to follow Jesus anymore, he found a way to profit from his betrayal. Decades later, Paul wrote these words to his young protege, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Mary's devotion resulted in sacrifice. Judas wanted to profit from that sacrifice. That's the opposite of devotion. It's the opposite of adoration. Now, in verses 7 and 8, John records his version of what Jesus said in reply. It's a shorter version than what you see in both Matthew and Mark. We're not going to go over and read those. Um, but there are two aspects of uh, John's version that are exactly the same. Purpose and priority. Jesus began by saying this, and this shows up in all three of these accounts. Let her alone. Leave her be. Don't bother her. Stop your criticism. She has a purpose in offering this sacrifice. Now, there's some debate as to how much Mary knew when she began her act of devotion, devotion, but there's no doubt from Jesus what her act meant. Whether Mary knew it or not, this was a pre-burial anointing. The purpose was to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. Now, typically when they prepared a body for burial, the person who was being prepared no longer had a use for the body. The person was already gone. But in this case, it was a prophetic statement of what was about to come. Mary's sacrificial devotion pointed to the cross, even though she probably didn't fully understand that. No doubt there was more on her mind than that. Appreciation for what Jesus had done in raising Lazarus. Devotion to the Messiah, period, and so forth. But it was also an act that allowed Jesus to draw attention to his pending sacrificial death on Calvary. Isn't it interesting that Mary's sacrificial adoration and devotion 
pointed to the sacrificial act that Jesus was about to do. Sacrifice was involved in all of this. How do you know that Jesus adores you? He sacrificed on your behalf. As for the poor, there are always poor people you can help. Mark said it this way, For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. That is not a statement of neglect. Whenever you wish, you may do them good. There's, that is not a statement of neglect. That is a statement of priority. There is a time and a place to help the poor. There is a time and a place to worship God. We do well to be sure we don't neglect worship in order to do social good. One of the things that has messed up the evangelical church in the United States today is they have convoluted those two thoughts. Helping the poor is worship in their mind. And they've lost sight of the fact that we should be on our knees with our heads raised to heaven, adoring our God. And the two things are not the same. Mary had her priorities in the right place. Now there's one more thing I want you to see from the parallel passages in Matthew and Mark. Both record that Jesus said these words, and they're, they're recorded the same way. At least they're the same in the New King James. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. How important was this to Jesus? <laughs> I don't think he could have made a more telling statement about how important this was. Whatever, wherever this gospel is preached, what she has done will be told as a memorial to her. Obviously, Jesus was moved by her sacrificial devotion. Now, what do we take away from this? The cross was about one week away. Whether Mary fully understood her act or not, she was preparing Jesus for his act of sacrificial devotion, which was Calvary. No cost was too high. I want you to dwell on that for a second. Yes, Mary and Martha and Lazarus were wealthy people, but to take a year's worth of salary all wrapped up in a little bottle and to give that in sacrificial devotion to Jesus, no cost was too high for Mary. And no objection from others was valid. I imagine that stung a little bit when Judas said that. But I doubt it stung for long because Mary had her priorities in the right place. She knew what she was doing, and she was doing it on purpose. No objection from others was valid. Love for the Savior drove Mary's devotion. And Mary's devotion, Mary's adoration, involved sacrifice. Devotion and adoration always do. So let me ask you a question. What is the state of your devotion to Christ? Is it a devotion of convenience? It's all well and good to honor the Lord Jesus as long as it doesn't cost me something or doesn't cost me too much. Is it a devotion of convenience? One of the criticisms of American Christianity from our brothers and sisters who live in other parts of the world is that we are a soft church in America. We're devoted as long as it's convenient. And when it's not convenient, we're not devoted anymore. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world will walk 
hours. Walk hours to get to church. Some of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world will suffer persecution from their friends, from their family, to the point of death because they are devoted to Jesus Christ. What is the state of your devotion to Christ? Is it convenience or are you like Mary willing to give him your heart of devotion no matter what the cost? It was only a week later that Jesus gave his all for you. And he gave it to save you from your sin and make you a child of God. No more important gift than you will ever receive from anybody else. Jesus died so that you could live. Jesus died to make you a child of God. Jesus gave his all. What are you willing to give him in return? Let's bow for prayer. Father, Mary is an example to us. She's an example of someone who adored you for all the right reasons. Someone who was devoted to the point of sacrifice. She's an example, and that's why she's recorded in Scripture. She is there for us to see and to follow. Father, I pray that you will help us to be people of adoring devotion, that we love the Lord Jesus so much that we'll give. We'll give the things that are the most important to us. We'll be willing to sacrifice because of what he's done for us. Thank you for this passage and thank you for, for what we learned from it. Help us to be like Mary, not like Judas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.